Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at Joy-Coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. He was sharing with me something that I had said to him in just casual conversation around a fire uh, up in the Boundary Waters. We were just sitting around talking about God and and I had said something, you know, just, you know, you, you don't really, I mean, you don't <laughs> you just talk around a, a campfire, you know. You're not like preaching it to you. Know, like. And uh, he said something that made him think so hard. <laughs> and uh, it just changed the way he started seeing Scripture. And uh, we were talking about, just around the fire, talking about the burning bush and the Moses standing on holy ground. You know, I mean, everybody knows the story. But I had said it wasn't the ground that was holy. It was holy, but it wasn't because the ground didn't have any faults in it. You know, it's because the presence of God was there. And that's why we're holy. It's not because we don't have any faults. It's because the presence of God is here. That's what makes us holy. It's not our... Holiness is not a trophy. You... you I'm holy. <laughs> I did it. I did enough. You sat on the walls and said, hey, look, I'm holy. No, it's not something you did. It's something he does. It's, why, is the, why is this called a holy Bible? Because it's, it's what's communicating through it. Just like the holy ground, the, the burning bush. It's what was communicating through those things. It was God's presence. Question is, what's communicating through us as we walk in this world? Is it his presence is is his word going forth from us you know is uh, are people sensing a difference uh, a wisdom from above or is it just wisdom of the world that's demonic and sensual you know which one is it so anyway so you never know that's why we do that yet <clears throat> we don't know who all's listening i didn't i didn't know he was listening all the time but he does and that's a blessing so anyway we're going to continue with the with the thought patterns and the uh, the concepts that we were talking about, you know, the, the, the truest thing about you is what God says about you. And it's, it's not what you think about you. It's not the way you think you line up with His Word. It's the way He knows that you line up with His Word. And uh, one of the things we talked about last week was in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And yes, I know this is talking about during the tribulation period of time. But there's a truth in this two verses that we're going to read that I want you to hear that we need to be passionate about. It says this. It says Second that Thessalonians two. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse nine. It says the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. See, so there's going to be wonders, but they're going to be false. Okay. And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish. So if you don't want to be deceived, see there's a reason these people are deceived. There's a reason they're unrighteous. And there's a reason that they fall for lying wonders. How many people know there's going to be things happen that you're going to go, Oh look, it's, 
It's cheese. No, it's not. It's a lying wonder. What makes them... Listen, the next verse tells us. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth. See, it's not... Uh, what we've been talking about for the last month is the difference between text and truth. The Pharisees knew the text of Scripture, but they didn't know the truth of Scripture. Does everybody understand that? It's not about knowing the book of the Lord. It's about knowing the Lord of the book. Does everybody hear that? It's about knowing Jesus. The book is a type and shadow of a good thing. You can know all the Scripture you want to know, but if you don't know Jesus, you're still not in right relationship with the Father. Man, I'll tell you what, that, that, that just... It's so hard for some people to get that, that through their heart that there's a... See, that's the difference between someone saying the right words, the textual words, I'll say it that way, in Romans uh, 10, 9. You can confess the Lord in your head, but that doesn't mean you know Him in your heart. See, that's the difference between someone knowing Romans 10, 9, and 10 in their head and Romans 10, 9, and 10 in their heart. We, we, we teach the grace message. But there's a difference. You can tell a difference. You know, when, when someone knows the, the doctrine of grace in their head, well, the grace because, of, yeah, 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 great, yeah, 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 yeah. But if they're not living in the power of grace, it's a false grace. See, there's the doctrine of grace, but if it's not, a, it's not, if it's not in your heart, if it's just in, doctrines in your head, relationships in your heart, you can have the right doctrine. And I tell you what, I, people argue, uh, I think last week we, we, we nailed something on the head. It says when you're uh, discussing, uh, Joy, put the, uh, this time on my note, uh, James chapter 3, verse, verse 16 and 17, and, uh, where it talks about the wisdom that is from above. We may have to start with, start with 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in what? Meekness of wisdom. So we're talking about wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast or lie against the what? Truth. <laughs> See, there's truth. And some of us, our thinking is contrary to that truth. If you're telling yourself that you're no good and God's word says you are good... You're lying against the truth. If you're telling yourself something different than other than what God sees you and what Jesus has done for you, you don't need to worry about the Antichrist coming because your mind is already against what Christ has done for you. When you, when you judge yourself different than the way Jesus has judged you, your opinion is greater than Jesus's. That's not, not, not to be so. But if you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your hearts, I tell you, we, we don't even talk about self-seeking. That, that can take us all over the place. Do not boast or lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and what? Demonic. It's demonic. Wow. Next verse. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, see, there, see there's wisdom, but there's two kinds of wisdom. Just like there's knowledge, remember, there's many trees in the garden. And there's two trees that are talked about. One is the tree of life. And the other one is the tree of what? Knowledge. Knowledge. And we can go ahead and say knowledge of what? Good and evil. What is the result of eating evil knowledge? Sin. Death. What's the result of eating good knowledge? Yeah. Death. Whoa. It's not about knowledge, carnal knowledge. It's about knowledge of life. The tree of life has a fruit. 
The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is one fruit that contains both good and evil. And it all leads to death. Because good knowledge leads you to self-righteousness. Well, is this right to do? Is this right? No. It, the question is, is it righteous? That's really the world that we should be living in. Is this righteous? Don't even ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do? Because that's... We can't get into that. That's imitating Jesus instead of manifesting Jesus. See, you can Im see religion will imitate. It just imit what does imitate mean? Copy. You're, you're faking it. You're putting on a show. But when you manifest Jesus, oh, this is the difference between text and truth. The Pharisees knew text. They didn't know the truth. Let's go, oh, go back to the verse we were on, Jordan. Wait But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then, then what? Peaceable. Gentle. Willing to what? Yield. I've seen more, and most likely you have seen more people. I'm not even going to say that you've done this. Of course, we, there. we would never do this. Other people do this, right? You know, break off relationships because of a disagreement. Because you've got to be right. Or they had to be right. Where does the desire of wanting to be right and the fear of being wrong comes from? The tree of the what? Knowledge of right and wrong, good and evil. And what's it do? It divides relationship. But the tree of life will keep relating. When, see, this, this willing to yield, when, just think what would happen. Just think of the relationships we'd have in our life just think of the churches that have divided and split because of, wow, well, we're right here. <laughs> Arguing over text instead of truth. You won't find any church dividing over Jesus. You'll always find them dividing over, well, this is the way we do communion. <laughs> well, it's sprinkling. No, it's baptism. No, it's tongues. No, it's not tongues. Text. Instead of truth. And I tell you what, just think of the relationships we'd have in our life if we would have yielded. When we valued the person more than the right and wrongness. When are we going to value people more than right and wrong? Wow. That's what we've been talking about and sharing for the last month. John 17, 17. Let's go ahead and put that on the board real quick. I've got to run through this to get to the main point. I've got a, a short time to do this. So I'm going to go pretty fast in this first part. We're going to slow down at the end. It says this, Sanctify them by your truth. truth. This is Jesus praying to the Father. Now who's doing the sanctifying? God is. You don't sanctify yourself. I don't care what denomination you go to. You can't sanctify yourself by doing right, right things and staying away from wrong things. That's self-righteousness. You it, Listen, wearing your hair a certain way doesn't sanctify you. Having worship on Saturday doesn't sanctify you. Jesus is our Sabbath, not a Saturday. Not a Sunday. Jesus is our Sabbath. He's, our rest. He's the one we're resting in. Man, I tell you, Sanctify them. He's talking. Jesus is talking to God. Sanctify them by your what? <laughs> it doesn't say text. But how many people go to the text and go, well, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this? Well, you may end up doing those things, but it's not gonna be because of your doing. It's because of what he's working on the inside of you. Man, I tell you, the, the, the scripture that literally says in the book of Hebrews, it says that. We have the spirits of just men made perfect. Your spirit is already made perfect. You don't have to feed your spirit. I've heard that for years. Just feed your... No. Your spirit's perfect. It's already in Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. Quit trying to work your way up and, bring, and instead bring yourself down. Quit trying to live a certain life so you can go to heaven. Realize that your spirit's already seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ. And just like Christ did, we need to find hell on earth and bring heaven to it. 
Too many Christians are trying to get out of here. Yes, we're going to go, hallelujah, bring it on. But while we're here, we need to find hell on earth and bring heaven to it. And if you can't find hell on earth, you're not looking. Maybe you don't know the difference. Ooh. Sanctify them by your what? Truth. truth. Not by text, but by your truth. See, we'll take the text and try to work it. There's one thing about righteousness. If righteousness is not revealed, it's worked for. That's what it says in, in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The, uh, your word is what? Truth. So His word, say His word. His word is truth. But what word? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. What word is truth? See, remember, the Pharisees knew text, but they didn't know the truth. Wow. It was in the song we sang. It was the spoken word. Is what is God speaking through His text? Are you, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, because the Spirit is speaking truth. In John chapter 16, that's what Jesus said the Spirit of God was going to do. He was going to come and teach us truth, all truth, because He's the Spirit of truth. That's why I encourage people, shut up. <laughs> Quit talking bad about the Holy Spirit. If you don't understand tongues, just be quiet. If you don't understand the fruits of the Spirit, just be quiet. Be willing to learn. But don't blaspheme. Man. I, I, I went to John 16. Yeah, you did. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Give me a second. It's not, no, cooperating. It's not cooperating well. Hold on. I'm holding on. <clears throat> for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. What? It's talking about the gospel of Christ. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, that's the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. It's what? What is revealed? The righteousness of God. It's revealed. If it's not revealed, you're going to work for it. Religion will tell you what to do to be righteous. Religion will tell you how to act to be holy. Religion will tell you how to, 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 what to do to be blessed. Instead of realizing you are already blessed. You're totally loved, fully pleasing, and complete in Christ Jesus with all the power of the resurrection available to you right now. If you're in Christ. Yep. If you're not in Christ, you don't have all that. You could be going to church and not be in Christ. Ooh. You may text. You may know the text. But do you know the truth? Well, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from what? Faith to faith. That is written, the just shall live by faith. faith. Man, I tell you what. Jesus' word is the truth. The truest thing about you is what God says about you. So I think it's good for us to go back into Scripture and get a foundation of what God says about us. You know, some people are trying to get God to love them. He already has. We call it, call it, we call it, we have been calling it wag the dog. You know that term? I know some of you have heard that term. Some of you probably haven't. Which does the dog wag his tail or does the tail wag the dog? The dog wags his tail. Well, the dog wags his tail. But a lot of people, when they read Scripture, they think the tail wags the dog. We get the, the action before the substance. We get the works before the relationship. <laughs> we get the doing before the being. Did you get that one? We're not human doings. We're human beings. beings. 
what he got to do to be a human being. You have to be born one. What do you have to do to be a, a son of God? A child of God? Be born one. Just be born one. Wow. You're already loved by God. Even before you became a son or a child of God. Man. But we got to love the truth. See, truth will set you on a journey that will take you beyond the text. Oh. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. I told Joyce, man, we're reaching back in the archives for this one. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 16, and I do have to hurry. Verse 16. Thank you. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were what? Eyewitnesses of His majesty. Now what is this referring to? Does anybody know? Now who's writing this book? Peter. Don't say the second Peter. <laughs> there was one. He wrote two books. It was the first Peter wrote the second Peter. No, just kidding. This is the second book that Peter wrote. And now, who was it? In Matthew 17, chapter 1, don't put that on the board, George, just leave it. In Matthew, 7, uh, Matthew 17, you have the what most people know as the mountain of transfer. Excuse, excuse me. Transfig I've said it so long wrong. <laughs> most people know it as the mountain of transfiguration. We call it the mountain of transfer. Because it's when, when Moses and Elijah transferred their authority, or that the <laughs> law and the prophets came to an end. Hmm. And Jesus began. We need to see that. But if you don't see that, you need to. The law and the prophets came to an end and Jesus began. In, in John chapter 1 verse 17, put that on the board real quick. John chapter 1 verse 17. It says, the law came through Moses... But for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So on this side of the mountain of transfer, transfiguration, you have Moses and Elijah. On this side you have Jesus who brought down grace and what? Truth. Got a question for you. If you hadn't seen this, you need to see this. For the law, say the law, the law. was given through Moses. What's missing? How come it doesn't say for the law and truth was given through mm -hmm. Moses? Didn't know the truth at that time. Man, man something wrong with my glasses. Sometimes we just read right past that. The law was given by Moses, but what? When did, when did truth show up? So when Jesus came. Because he's truth. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Man, we need to understand the rightly dividing the word of truth. We, we, we can't get into that. Let's go, let's go back up to the scripture and 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we did not fall coming devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but were eyewitnesses. This is what he's referring to. Peter is referring to this moment in Matthew chapter 17 when he was witnessing Moses and Elijah and Jesus and the transfer of spiritual authority from one covenant to the next covenant. That's what's taking place. And he witnessed this. And while he was witnessing this, do you remember the story? Peter says, hey, Jesus, do you want us to... Be? Now, he, don't, you have to excuse me for being so slight, but... Do you want us to make three, tabern uh, uh, three tabernacles? One for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for you? And while he was speaking, the scripture said, a voice came out of heaven. This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him! Who had the Jewish people been listening to before that? Moses and Elijah. 
And God at this point in time said, don't listen to them no more. Hear Him. Let me, let me say it this way. Don't live according to the law anymore. Live, it, live according to grace and truth. I know that hurts a lot of people. But I love to hurt people. Some people love to bless people. I just love to hurt them. <laughs> just kidding. Some people says it hurts so good. Verse 17. For he received from God. This is what he this is what they know Jesus received. When he heard what? Well, we'll talk about that. For he received from God the Father. Say Father. Father. Honor and glory when such a voice was it a text? <laughs> Did God send Jesus a text? No. That's why I don't like text. Text, take the text. The only way you can put any feeling into a text is throw an emoji in there. <laughs> That's not real relationship, is it? Give me a break. You know, it takes the relationship out of the the text. Oh, text versus truth. Oh, we shouldn't have done that, should we? Okay, God didn't send Jesus a text. Jesus heard God's voice. He heard His Father's say voice. voice. Say He heard. He heard his father's voice. His father's voice. He that has an ear, let him hear, yeah. hear what the Spirit is. And the Spirit is always speaking what? Say truth. Truth. Man. For he received from the Father honor and glory when a voice came to him from the excellent glory. And what was the voice that he heard? This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And what did Jesus receive when he heard this affirmation of sonship? Honor and glory. Honor and glory in identity. When he did not get the text, but when he heard the voice. That's pretty good right there. <laughs> when he heard God's voice, his father say, What? You are my beloved son, and whom I'm well pleased. He received what? Honor and glory and sonship, identity. And uh, real easy, the word honor literally means value and dignity. It means worthy. He, he knew that he was worthy. He knew he was valuable. And he knew, and that's where we get our dignity from. A lot of people don't have dignity because they don't have value. They don't have value because they hadn't heard from God the way God sees them. They're judging their life from the past because of what they have and haven't done. The decision, either what's happened to them or what they've done to others or any combination of things, they, they're receiving their lack of value from their lack of education. <laughs> How many people ever get an F on a test? I got to raise both hands because <laughs> I'm dyslexic. I can't read very well. And I was in remedial work all my educational life. Had to, in high school, I had the same classes, same students, same teacher. Never made it past fractions. You know, never passed the spelling test in my life. I mean, never, just, we won't go there, okay? I always thought I was dumb because of what my performance was. When I got a D, I was happy. I made progress. But it's usually because I guessed enough right answers. Because we always had multiple choice. With multiple choice, I love it because you could always have a chance of being right. You didn't have to know. You just know A, B, C, or D. You know, pick one. <laughs> we won't go there. Enough about me. But anyway, I judge my value by my lack of grades. I knew people that got A's all the time. Guess what? I saw them as being more valuable than me. Don't you? You know, you, you, that's the way we are in our world. This world teaches us to be our, that our value is based on our performance. And the same thing in church, it's called performance-based Christianity. Most people are raised with the mindset coming out of the world. They have a carnal wisdom, a carnal mindset, a carnal way of thinking. And they, they bring that way of thinking into when they read text in Scripture. And they just see the negative in here. They see the not... See, the, there's things in the Scripture that you can never live up to. You know, 
I, I don't understand. People say, I, they, they go, I just, I believe everything in red. Well, cut your hands off then. Pluck out your eye. <laughs> if you believe everything in red, Jesus said to do it. You know, that's text versus truth. Yeah, come on. I'm sorry. Most people get their value from their performance. Jesus got his value, his dignity, his worthiness from what he heard. Say heard. Heard. Not a text, but from what he heard the Father say about him. So, where should we get our value and our dignity? From what we hear God says about us. The truest thing about you is God's opinion about you. Matter of fact, that's the word glory. He received honor, which is value, dignity, and worthiness. And glory. The word glory literally means view and opinion. Well, whose view? God's. And whose opinion? God's opinion. And God's view, the word opinion, literally, you can't even say the word glory and understand its opinion and view without realizing that the word glory means it's, 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 it's not his opinion of you being negative. It's his opinion about you in, in righteousness. It's, it's bringing you into completeness, not into lackness. He's not looking at you and saying, oh, you're no good. That would not be glory. Glory is, oh, you're my beloved. He looks at us in Christ. Joy put Ephesians chapter 2. two. Uh, this is what this verse says in, uh, the, in the Amplified. Listen to this. Give me a second. And, and, and if you haven't heard this verse in the Amplified, you need to hear this about you. This is God's, this is the way God feels about you. But God, so rich is He in His mercy. Because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which He loves you. That's good. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. I didn't write it. <laughs> but God, so rich is He in His mercy. Because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which He loves you. Well, us, but you. Next verse. Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcoming and trespasses. When did He love you with intense love? When you were this way. Damn. <laughs> So why do you think He loves you more intensely when you're not that way? Yeah. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more than He already has. Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcoming and trespasses, He made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us a ver the very life of Christ Himself. Man, we can't keep reading on I gotta get over the this. rest of five. Just the rest uh, of five. Oh, please. The same new life with which he gave quickened him, for it is by grace, his favor and mercy, which, which you do not deserve, that you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made a partakers of Christ. Salvation. Man. Why? Because his intense love. Notice it didn't say to satisfy your. Go, go back up to. The first, but God so rich in His, uh, so rich is He in His mercy, not judgment, <laughs> not wrath. Read these. Start reading the text with some heart. I beseech ye by the mercies of God. <laughs> that word beseech just pulls it out. But be so rich. But God so rich in is He in His mercy. Because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which He, it's, He wants to satisfy His desire to love you. 
He's got a desire. What, what's the difference? I don't have time to get into this. What's the difference between angels and men? Real simply, don't answer. Let me, let me tell you. Yes, angels have a free will. Don't say they don't. A third of them chose with their will to fall from heaven, to, to rebel in heaven. They had a free will. Angels were created to serve. Nowhere in the Bible, the Word of God, in the text, in the Scripture, or even in the, anything, commentaries, do angels love God? Or does God love angels? God loves angels, but some angels don't love God. No, but nowhere in there does it say God loves angels. Well, do you love what He created them? He created no, them. no. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that God loves or angels love God. They worship Him. Yeah, they do. There's a difference between worship and love. Mankind is God's creation. See, we were created in sin. And the only thing we can choose not to do is sin. The only thing we can do is choose to love God. God is just looking for a group of people that will love His love. Humans have the capacity for love. Angels don't. God made us with the ability to receive love and then return it. God doesn't need anybody to love Him. He has no need. He wants to satisfy His love. So that's what part of Lucifer. By having somebody to love. Lucifer, who became Satan, didn't know that God was going to have children. Surprise! See, Jesus was the only begotten Son of God, but that was His title. It's not anymore. He's the first of what? Many brethren. Let's get on with this. One. Where's the rabbit trail? Joy should have up the rabbit trail thing. So Jesus received, uh, in Matthew 17, He received honor, glory, and identity. He value and dignity. He... he he received God's opinion about him and he also received dignity. But this wasn't the first time that he had heard this. Remember, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Put that on the board real quick. This That was all introduction to get to where... Sorry. I'll do this real quick. Okay, you just go home and enjoy this. Read it yourself. And when Jesus was baptized, he let, went up... Let, up. Let me go back to the New King James, sorry. Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. This is when he was being baptized by John the Baptist, before he did anything in ministry. Now, we won't, we, there's so much we can talk about here. There are several things Jesus is fulfilling at this very moment in time, but we're going to talk about this. When he had been baptized, he came up immediately from the waters, and behold, the, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting upon him. And suddenly, a voice, say a voice! A voice. He didn't get a text. <laughs> That's pretty good stuff right there. And suddenly, a voice came from heaven. Do you, do you realize... Back in Genesis, God asked Adam, well, whose voice were you listening to? Question is, whose voice are you listening? Whose voice have you been listening to? Has it been God's word speaking to you? Or has it been your past speaking to you? Wow. Talk about being set. See, the truth will set you free from what? It'll set you free from you. Man. And suddenly a voice, I love the word voice, it just comes out from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Had he done anything to deserve it? Say no. no. Have you done anything to deserve it? Say no. no. So why are you trying to do something to deserve it? Instead of living in a life knowing that you already have deserved it. And you already have received it, but you're just not aware. You haven't renewed your mind to the truth of the text. Mm. Wow. Mm. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son 
And health sounds familiar, doesn't it? Now, now you know the story. Now, we're going to go through this fairly quick for the sake of time. What was the first temptation of Jesus Christ? Does anybody know the first temptation of Jesus Christ? Turn these stones Let, away. Let's, let's, let's just go ahead and read it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew stones. chapter 4. If you are the son of God. Yeah, there you go, Jerry. Because you've been here long enough to know better than what you just said. I wasn't going to correct you. I wasn't going to correct you, Jerry, out open. Yeah, if you are the son of God. No, I wouldn't have said that. All right. Uh, chapter uh, 4, verse 4. But he answered and said, it, excuse me, uh, verse 3. Now when the tempter came to him, and let, let, me, let me say this. See, a lot of people get into works, and I believe in prayer, and I believe in fasting, I believe in all, but as a result of relationship, but because some people are so spiritually minded, they think after fasting that the voice they hear is the Holy Spirit's. Here's an example of the first voice that Jesus heard, Jesus, Son of God, heard after fasting 40 days wasn't God's. The Scripture says, My sheep know my voice. My voice. Sure. Okay, let's go on. The, te the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become what? Bread. bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Text? <laughs> word. Does it say every text written in Scripture? No! By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of paper. <laughs> it's one thing to read about it. It's another thing to hear him tell you that he, you're his beloved. The temptation was to turn the rocks into bread. The temptation was to, if you be the Son of God, get him to doubt or to prove who he was by his performance. Prove it. Prove it by what you do and what you don't do. If you're the Son of God, if do something. If you're a good Christian. Yeah. If you're a good Christian, go to church every Sunday. <laughs> Tithe every penny you've got. If you're a good Christian, come and serve this church when we need you to. I'm, I'm, I'm not, nothing wrong with tithing. Nothing wrong with going to church every Sunday. Nothing wrong with serving at your church. Mm -hmm. But don't let think that's what makes you right with God. Don't let that be your identity. Because here it says, matter of fact, Jesus' response. I love this. you got to stop and think. Start meditating on these things. What was written and engraved on stones? The law. Maybe right here, turn the law into bread. Turn the law into life. Maybe the stones represent law. There was nothing wrong in the law. He could have turned it into roast beef. Maybe stones in Scripture, when you read them, represent the law. What father will give his son a stone? A stone when he asks for bread. Life. Jesus said, my body's bread. He didn't say, my body's stone. <laughs> wow. Well, it does work that way. Read scripture. Stone represents law. <clears throat> law versus life. Jesus wasn't going to put us into performance based Christianity. He said man's going to have his value and his dignity. His worth. His opinion of himself is going to come from where? The voice. Let's just read again. Man shall not live by bread alone but by Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's truth. God only can speak truth. So the truest thing about you is what God says about you. Your value, your dignity, your life is going to come from what God has, what you hear in your heart. That He loves you to satisfy the intense love in which He has for you. He did what He's done. There's just. Let's do this real quick. The second temptation of Christ. 
Verse 6, And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, what's the temptation? It's not to do what's about he's asking to do. It's to get him to question if he's the Son of God or not. See, the, the devil isn't about you doing... He doesn't care if you do good things. He cares if you think it's going to make you the Son of God or not. Because then it's self-righteousness. It's not Christ's righteousness. And he said, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And then he quotes Scripture. Have you ever heard someone quote Scripture and put you under guilt and condemnation and works? Absolutely. That's the devil at work even in a church. Did I say? Yeah, I said that. He shall give his angels charge. Is that what the Scripture says? Yeah. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written, <laughs> You shall not tempt the Lord your God. I, I, I love this. We, we, for the sake of time, I don't have time to finish all these. But if this principle is true, we should be able to see it somewhere else. Let me reach in my pocket. See if I can find a place. Oh, Genesis chapter 2. Turn over to Genesis chapter 2. Actually, Genesis chapter 3. Verse 4, Joey. Adam and Eve in the garden. The serpent comes to Eve. Then the serpent said to the woman. Let's go up to verse 2. And the woman said, oh, let's go to verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? What tree? Well, they couldn't eat. Remember what we said? One tree. Well, they can eat from all of them. Yeah. But he shouldn't eat from one of them. And that was the tree of the what? Knowledge. Lest okay. you will lest you die. You shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. First of all, did God say don't touch it? No. Man, they could have juggled that sucker and not died. Who told her not to touch it? Yeah. Adam. She was, she was a, when God told Adam not to eat it, she was a rib. She had never heard God speak. She had never heard the voice of God speak that word. She was just told. Does that sound like most church? Where, see, our whole system of churchdom is we, we pay a man to climb the mountain of God and come down on Sunday morning and tell us what he said. And we don't hear. But until we start hearing the voice of God in our heart about who we are, we will always be challenged and live in a works performance based relationship. The serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in that day you eat of it. Your eyes will be open. Is that true? Yes. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That is very true what happened. But I got a question. Was she already like God? Well, how could she? She was already like. She, Adam and Eve were created in the image and the, the, likeness. the likeness. She was already like God, but the deceiver made her think she wasn't good enough that she could do something in the flesh, carnal, to make herself more accepting to God. You can't do it, don't fall for the deception that Eve fell for. You can't do anything to make yourself more accepting. Matter of fact, uh, another scripture i got to read real quick in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Verse 3, Joy. I'll let you put it on the board. I sure hope that's it. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear at least somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his what? Craftiness. So your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. 
Mm. What's this talking about? It's a reference to the Gentiles. Don't get caught up in trying to be something you already are. Most Christians are trying to become something they already are. They're trying to become accepted. They're trying to become loved. They're trying to become blessed. The book of Ephesians is everything that pertains to life and goddess has already been given. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 2 and 3. Joy, real quick. Grace and peace be unto you from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has what? Blessed us with every spiritual blessing and what? Heavenly places in Christ. You've already been blessed, people. You don't have to ask God to bless you. And quit asking God to bless others. Don't go around and say, well, God bless you. You're asking God to bless them. Stop it. Show me in the Bible where it says for you to ask God to bless people. That's just religion. I'll show you places in the Bible that says for you to bless them. Quit copping it out on God. It says for you to bless those that persecute you. Well, God yeah. bless you. No, no God, God, God made you full of blessings so you can bless others. Oh man, it's so good. Has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundations of the world. That's before Genesis 1.1. You were chosen to be loved by God. Watch this. You were chosen to be holy and without blame before Him in what? Love. Not judgment. <laughs> you were chosen personally to be right now in this period of time in the world to be loved by God. For all eternity. That's how special you are. Before the world was creation, created, God said, no, I want Jerry to live right now so I could love him right now and experience the truth, the mystery that's been hidden from ages and generations. I want Jerry to know what that mystery is. is I want Sandy, I want Joy. I want Jonathan Rod. I, I want these that I've saved for such a time as this to experience my love right now. His intense love. Man. Next we can't one. keep reading. I got going. If this principle is true, there should be more references. Turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27. Yes, Curtis. Matthew comes before Luke. Okay. Not if you're dyslexic. Matthew chapter 27. Want me to put it up there? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's up there. Verse 40. Verse 39. And those who pass by blasphemed him wagging their heads this is when he was on the cross we talked about the first temptation of Christ we talked about the first temptation of man in the garden here's the last temptation of Christ matter of fact in the book of Luke when it talks about the uh, the three temptations of Jesus it says that Satan left for a more opportune time when was that most opportune time for Satan to come back and question if he's the Son of God? When he's hanging on the cross and saying, the centurion looks up, you who, destroy, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, you yourself, if you are the Son of God, there it is again, if you be the Son of God, come down, from the cross. That's the more opportune time when he was struggling the greatest. And the song goes, he could have called 10,000 angels. But he died alone. Even at the cross, he could have, but he would have thrown us into a performance-based Christianity. Jesus never did anything to prove who he was. 
who he was proved what he did. That's wagging the dog, and the dog wagging the tail. The tail wagging the dog, or the dog wagging the tail. What Jesus did didn't prove he was the Son of God. Because he was the Son of God, he did what he did. The question I've got for you is whose voice are you listening to? Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to open up your wisdom and your logic. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. We simply ask that you continue to do what only you can do in our lives. Grace us with the ability to repent, to change the way we think. Bring to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of your role in our life, what Jesus really has done to fulfill the eternal plan of the Father that was established before the foundations of the world. May we realize how loved we truly are. May we realize how accepted we already are. May we realize the blessings that are freely given to us because of whose child we are. Not because of what we do, but because of what we've heard from you. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at CokerMinistries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ's righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at Joy-Coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries. 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.